Think about how many times Sean White falls. Right? He's the greatest snowboarder of our generation, right? Think about how many times he falls. Think about how many times LeBron missed a game with a shot. They are the greatest of their, of their generation in what they do, and yet they quote-unquote fail all the time. You know, they're constantly trying to figure out, how do I push it? How do I go to the next level? How do I do this? And I don't know, for me, it was a competition. If Michael Strahan had two sacks in a game, I want three. If I got 10 fingers, then why am I selling at two Super Bowls? Think about that. I look at my hand and be like, eight of my fingers are <laughs> pissed off. <laughs> I would like to introduce our first host for today. Not only is he our chief brand officer, he is the co-creator of the shop, Paul Rivera. Paul Rivera, can we please give him a warm round of applause? How's everybody doing? Yeah, we gotta do better than that. This, ready? There we go, there we go, there we go, there we go. This gentleman is a two-time Super Bowl champion and looks like he might be able to suit up on Sunday if we need him. Give a great hand to Mr. Justin Tuck, please. You ready to bring up our guests? Absolutely, man. This is going to be fun. This is going to be interesting. Let's do it. So our next guest, this is everyone's favorite uncle. Give it up for Eamon Joseph. Yeah! He's going to bring the energy that we know. Come on. <laughs> so our final guest, um, multi-Grammy. Um, I think he just came off winning an MTV award as well. Super talented. Um, give it up for John Batiste, please. There he is. Give it up, give it up, give it up. We're doing this. We're doing this. Here we are. I want to start with you. I mean, it's only right. We're in MetLife, a place um, you've had an enormous amount of success. How's it feel to be back in the building? I love MetLife, but I still call this Giant Stadium. I know y'all, if y'all turn around, they've got another team <laughs> stuff up right now. But this is the place that we made home, right? Having the success that we had. So I'm actually very excited to see um, the HBCUs get exposure in, you know, in a house that I can kind of say I built in some regards. Yeah. And it's ex exciting to be up here with you guys and, 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 and getting a lot more exposure to this culture. Dope. Good to have you back. Good to have you back. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Um, you've been, you're a Howard alumni. That's right. Come on, HU, you know. <laughs> you know. What's up? Come on, HU, I see y'all out here. What's up? Let's start with what your HBCU experience was and what it meant to you. And what it meant to me is I'm from Harlem, New York. Um, I grew up, you know, in the, in the city and a college experience. I really didn't know what to expect. I knew that I was going to a historical black college, but what does that mean? There's a reason to have this education that is specifically tailored to us. There's a history behind that. When we weren't afforded the same type of, um, the same type of education as other people. So to me, you know, I, I, there's a circle of truth around my head to make sure that I let people know that a historical black college experience is a great education. It is tailored and designed for us, and it keeps our communities upward mobile. It keeps us educated. It's a pillar to the community. Um, so it was amazing going there, but I had to learn that once I got there. Love that. Love that. Give it up. Love that. Yo. John, um, coming to you a couple years back, um, you did a virtual concert with some of the top um, HBCU bands, which is why I'm here. I'm here for the bands. I'm going to keep it all the way, all the way a buck. Um, why was that important to you, and then why, how was that experience? Man, I, I grew up in New Orleans, and, and I went to high school at St. Aug, Marching 100, shout out Purple Knights. I was a member of the Purple Knights. I have a long legacy in my family of people who were in that historically black high school marching band. And that school, both athletically and from the marching band is a feeder system to HBCUs. I was on the path to Howard, but I got into Juilliard, and it really gave me this viewpoint of the world having had that whole experience, not just at St. Aug in New Orleans, but 
growing up in a musical culture where music is part of the fabric of everyday life. People playing horns on the corner when you go into the corner store. So coming from that and then being in Juilliard, which is like a very European classical, not black Southern marching band aesthetic, it was an experience that opened my world. Because now I'm like, and that's one of the reasons I feel like I'm very slept on. I don't want to talk my talk. Well, but Speak I'm on it. We're in the shop. Speak talk on it. Talk your talk. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it's because I've existed between the world I grew up in and then made a world within a world that I didn't grow up in. And now I'm bringing them together. And that's really ahead of its time. So it's going to take 10 years for people to realize the contributions that I'm, I've made to my culture. But that's why I do things like that, because... I'm connecting things that haven't been connected in our generation for the future. And I think for our culture, that's very important so that we can see there's more ways to be. There's limitless possibilities of how we can be and exist. They just have to see us. They have to see a version of us that's like not the version or the few versions that are allowed in the media and that's opened up and that's developed and that's become more expansive. But that's what I do my thing for. Yeah, definitely give up back. All I heard is that we could have had this genius at Howard University. Is that, is that, is that what y'all heard? That's what I heard. Now, let's talk about your journey to like get to where you are. Because obviously, people that don't know your story will think like, okay, like right now it looks like it's easy. Right. Ooh, there ain't no overnight, man. There ain't no overnight. You, the, 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 the level of work ethic on the craft... It's maddening. I started at eight, and I was, you know, my father, my, he was my first musical mentor. I come from a family, big family, like the Jackson Five. You know, you put the cute young cousin or nephew or brother in front. I was the youngest of 30 cousins. My, my, I have seven uncles in the family band. We were playing in the, in the front yard of my grandma's house. And then when I left that, I came to New York. It was just a matter of hustling, taking whatever gig that I could take, I survived off Goya beans every night for a while, living in Harlem. You might be Puerto, you might be half Puerto Rican. No, just, just, <laughs> Bruh, them Goyas go off. <laughs> it's fire. I was there. I'm, I'm telling you, we, we had, it was just a, a, a matter of living in this conservatory environment, going out hustling, living in the conservatory, going out hustling. Perfect example, the first time I played in MetLife, I was 19. I, played, I was playing jazz clubs at the time. And I was known mainly as just a jazz artist, not even singing, not dancing, not making my own. I was making independent albums. I was playing in a jazz club in, in, um, in Los Angeles. In the back of the club is Prince. Prince is in the back. I don't know he's in the club. I don't know that he's even listening to the band. I get a call a week later. Prince wants you to go on tour. Prince wants you to join the band. He's doing a four-city tour, two nights at MetLife, two nights at MSG. He's got three bands. He wants you to be in one of the bands. I never met him. I didn't know. I was like, how did he hear? I meet him. He tells me, that's, I heard you in, in L.A. a week ago at the Catalinas. First time I was on stage here was playing with Prince. That's the kind of journey that I've had. That's amazing. Let's give it up, please. Yeah, please. You guys are just getting to, to know... John, I, I love, I mean, his craft, he's an artist. I love how, like, smoothly he styles on all of us. He's like, my first time at MetLife, um, you know, or this little school called Juilliard. I'm not sure if you guys have, have quite heard of it. Um, but I think, I think this, you know, look, for all of us that were all, and we were talking about this in the back, for all of us that are on our journey, right, at different levels, different phases or stages of our journey, you know, LeBron always says there's, there's, there's a generation now that sometimes thinks it's like instant oatmeal, it's, you know, because I see the post. I see the post of you at MSG, like you must have got there because you had a hot, you know, song or a hot verse or whatever the case may be. Um, it's fairly, I won't even say easy, but common to like, you could bump into a hit or you can bump into a good season or a good project. The consistency in a body of work, what's the process like to having longevity and success? No one really understands the journey that hasn't tried to do it. So it's, it's almost like foreign language when I tell you the process or tell you like how I think about it. For example, like, like you said, it's easy for someone in a contract year to say, oh, I'm going to work out at 4 a.m. every day. 
And once I get that contract, man, I don't, you know, you don't see them having that same process, right? I, I've made it. Once you quote unquote make it, it's, it's hard to continue to do that. You think about, let's, I know you know LeBron very well. I know his process very well. Let's, let's use him for example. Since he was 16 years old, he's had a very similar process of separating himself from all the nonsense, all the noise. And people wonder why he is arguably the greatest athlete ever, right? But also he's great at everything else he does because he still has the same process in that as well. He takes the same commitment, determination, hard work, uh, lunacy in, in his philanthropy work, him as a father, him as a et cetera, et cetera. And I know these gentlemen can appreciate that because they do the same thing in their craft. For me, the process was, it was, it was hard because you had to have a process not only for yourself as a player, but also we, we sit on a team of 53 guys. So you also had to have a, try to have a process for those other guys because like a lot of my success was dictated by the other 10 people that was on the field with me. So like, I, yeah, I had my process and I knew push come to shove, I was going to be in shape. I was going to know the defense that we was going to run. I was going to know everything about the offense that we was going to go against. I was going to know what Tom Brady wanted to do on third and 10 with the ball on the left hash with Gronk in the, in the, in the slot position into the boundary with the offset back to the left when the clock was at, you know, Three minutes and forty-six seconds. By the way, I have, I have no idea board. what you just said. Exactly, I have right? No. So that's that's the lunacy, no and I'm sure these guys could talk about things around music and things about their craft and, and the arts that I wouldn't understand either. But like that's that's the level of detail that you have to be to be great. You know, we talked about the process. That's the one thing people don't see, right? We just see outcome, and it's very easy to be sitting in the crowd or in my seat or you know, fans of you guys that see you on the hit show or see you at the Super Bowl or see you, you know, on tour and to think that it was a straight line there, right? Um, we know there's nothing further from the truth, right? There's been pivots along the way. I'd like to talk about some of those pivots and maybe even, you know, don't want to put words in your mouth, but at any of those pivots, did you even reach like grander heights? Like I thought this was a setback, but the fact that I went this way actually got me to a better place. We're in a strike. Everyone knows actors, writers right now are going through a strike. Please have solidarity with us right now. But during this time, it is a great opportunity for me because I get to study. I'm not on set. That's how I see things. It's not like, oh, wow. No one can work, so I'm depressed. Oh, no. I get to work on other skills that I'm going to be able to put into my work so that when we get out of this moment, it just makes me that much more of a consistent artist. I feel like a part of this journey also is the humbling of the ego. I feel like because I, I'm so focused on my craft that often God teaches me through this craft. And therefore, I have to stumble. I have to get up and realize that I have to readjust things in my life. Um, I remember as a, as a young, as a, one of the first jobs, and I, I never tell this story. Look at y'all getting stuff out of me. Um, I had an I had a opportunity to do a project in New York coming straight out of college. It was going to set me up. Three picture deal, and I was excited about it, but I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. I did not know that I wasn't ready. And I proved myself assured that I destroyed this opportunity. I came in late. I was, I was late maybe to about three producer sessions. I was cocky about it. Oh, I got it. Don't worry. It's about that I'm a good actor. Don't, don't, don't trip. The small things that, like you said, the discipline that you need to, half the job is doing the small things correct every time. I didn't have that a part of my game. I thought that I could wing it. I thought, ah, when I show up, I'll show up. That was a lesson that I lost that entire, I lost the first project, which subsequently, subsequently made me lose the, 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 uh, the two after that. And it broke me. It broke me. I, well, how could this happen? 
I'm better than this. Why don't they know me, the type of person that I am? And couldn't they see past the flaws? But I had to get with myself and realize, Amen, there's certain things that this is a business. And even though people may like you, people may want to work with you, you have to do the small things right. Attention to detail and tucking one's pride and knowing that at any time this can be taken away. That still lives with me today with every job that I go on, every room that I walk into. John, I want to give you the opportunity to answer the same question just about pivots in your, in your journey. So I'm thinking about pivots. The earliest pivot that I can think of is the pivot from sports to music. I played AAU basketball and I played at, in, in, in high school. And at a certain point, we won a national championship in 2002. 2003, from that year, 15 to 16, everybody got taller. Everybody got better. <laughs> you look at the other prospects around the country, Dwight Howard, oh, snap. Josh Smith, oh, well, okay. This ain't me. I started playing the piano at 11. By the time I'm 14, I developed very quickly in that span of time, but I still wasn't, there was some holes in my development. So I hadn't really fully committed to music until 17. You just gotta be open to the cues of what life is giving you. And then as you start to see who you are, defining your process, what you were saying really hit me, the specificity of process. What does it mean to work hard? How many hours do you do this versus that? We had a thing we used to call throwing yourself in the water. Where, you know, when I moved to New York, my band, we would say, now it's time to get your rejection in. Because we, we, <laughs> throw yourself in the water. Go do something where you're going to get rejected or you might get rejected. Go try to talk to somebody. <laughs> go, go, because that was, we were having trouble at that moment in time figuring out how we were going to step to the front of the stage, do the choreography, and then somebody take this solo without fear. Because we were coming from jazz where people didn't do that, and we were trying to transition, connecting those dots. So we had to get used to the feeling of being vulnerable and out there in front of people. You, just stuff like that. I, don't, I could keep going on, but you know, that's... I want to ask you guys something too, because you, you, you said something that really laid on me. Failure, he said, he doesn't even see failure, right? Like, for, for Paul and, and just, like, what does failure look like? What, what does that look like? Because people, I see the shorties, like, they're afraid to fail. It's easy to see people that are afraid to fail. You got to dare to fail. You know what I mean? You, you, have to, you have to have this appetite to get over stuff. What does that look like in you guys' process? I would say, Eamon, to answer your question, you know, we've talked a lot about process, and I think failure is exactly that part of the process. So I, I'll give you a very short story. I picked up snowboarding like 10 years ago, and I went with a buddy who taught me how to snowboard, and it probably took me four years to snowboard to go on a trip without falling, right? And I was really proud of myself, and I called my boy that taught me. I'm like, yo, you're not going to believe this, man. I'm like, I didn't fall today. And he was like... That's dope, but it just means you weren't going fast enough. Or right? you weren't on the right slope. And the lesson, right? And the lesson in that is, it's like, if you're operating at a high enough, if you're not experiencing any failure, you're not challenging yourself enough, yeah. right? If you haven't been outacted on a project, if you haven't, you know, been on stage with Prince, right? If you haven't been to the pro, like, if you are constantly challenging yourself, there are going to be these moments Call them failure, call them whatever you want to call them. There are going to be these moments where you're like, oh, this is this level, and it's going to take a different level of commitment, a different level of, you know, dedication to the process to get over that thing. So um, think I about, don't... Think about how many times Sean White falls. Right? He's the greatest snowboarder of our generation, right? Think about how many times he falls. Think about how many times LeBron missed a game with a shot. Think about how many times, you know, whoever, you know, filling the plate, right? Think about how many times Denzel has missed a line. I don't, I don't know. I'm just trying to think about how many times Prince has missed a key or Michael Jackson, you know, was out of tune on a pitch. Whatever it is, right? They are the greatest of their, of their generation in what they do, and yet they quote-unquote fail all the time. So it's why do they process. fail? Probably because they're pushing the limits of yep. what they're trying to accomplish. They're not sitting down and being comfortable in what they're doing. I know for a fact, I don't, I don't know these gentlemen that well. We've, I've, I've been fans of them, and we got to talk back there. But I can tell they're constantly pushing the envelope. 
And that's why you will remember their name. And I don't know, for me, it was a competition. If Michael Strahan had two sacks in a game, I want three. If X, Y, Z, if I got 10 fingers, then why am I selling at two Super Bowls? <laughs> that's just how you, the, and, and that's madness, right? Because no one has won two super, 10 Super Bowls. I'm probably the reason why Tom Brady didn't win 10, but no one has won <laughs> 10 Super Bowls. But like, I constantly think about that. I look at my hand and be like, eight of my fingers are pissed off. <laughs> But you know what? When you fail at such a high level, that's, that's why it also it's an individual journey because only we know what will challenge us and when it's time to pivot, like you said, to get that when you don't have those butterflies. You said, when you said that, I said, oh, because that's even scary. Oftentimes, I go, wow, I've been enamored. I've been just like mystified with this craft for so long. Is it really Will I wake up one day and go, hmm, I think about that because at that point, like you said, I will have to make a decision to do something and, and put the, my life force into something else and that will be a pivot in that and I will because I know I have the circle of truth of knowing the type of dedication that it will take to do the next thing with the same type of proficiency, you know what I mean? But no one else would know that. That's, that's, a, that's something that you have to do your self-inventory to know that because to the outside world you're failing at such a you, you, you're you're failing at such a a rate that some people can't really see of that course. you're failing yeah, they yeah, can't see the like success yeah. love that love that love that yeah. ladies and gentlemen on behalf of amen john my co-host justin tuck thank you for coming out to the shop that's a wrap yes sir 